all too familiar images of a climate in crisis. But now there's a manual to respond agreed by every government on the planet. We have a chance, just, to avoid climate catastrophe if we move fast away from oil and gas toward renewable energy. The 1.5 degree limit is achievable, but it will take a quantum leap in climate action. This report is a clarion call to massively fast-track climate efforts by every country and every sector and on every time frame. In short, our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. This report lands in a world where the impacts of climate change are making headlines all the time. From the devastating floods in Pakistan last year to record-breaking 40 Celsius temperatures here in Britain. So the implications are obvious for policymakers and governments around the world, not least right here in the UK with our obligations to a net zero economy. The report starts with the absolute scientific fact, unequivocally, humans are changing the climate through greenhouse gas emissions and rapid and deep and in most cases immediate greenhouse gas emissions reductions are essential in all sectors to keep global temperature rises to 1.5 Celsius. Right now they're increasing. All of the climate parameters are moving into totally wrong direction. Temperatures, uh, ocean warming, ocean acidification, melting of glaciers, uh, sea level rise, uh, flooding and drought events uh, and concentrations of uh, main greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous uh, oxide. Current projections for oil and gas burning mean that without additional abatement, they would exceed the remaining carbon budget for 1.5 Celsius. In other words, we can't meet our climate targets if oil and gas companies are allowed to drill like they want to. Good news is that we have both economically and technically attractive means to limit the the warming even to the 1.5 degrees at the transition is also a great opportunity for new businesses and uh, financial savings. So what does this mean for the UK? British homes on fire during last year's heat wave. Advice from the International Energy Agency globally and the government's advisory climate change committee calls for the following. We should not open a new coal mine in Cumbria or drill more North Sea oil and gas. We should allow onshore wind and solar. We must vastly accelerate the electric vehicle sector and invest in a national home insulation and heat pump program. Swaffham Prior in Cambridgeshire, up and running an air and ground source heat pump power station for the entire village. Treasury cash, funneled via Cambridge County Council to set it up. If we're to meet our uh, carbon zero target of 2045, we're going to have to roll out projects like this at massive scale over the next 10 to 20 years. That's how you bypass the likes of Putin. That's absolutely right. Existing tech, cheap long-term loans, zero emissions. Hi, come in. Mike Barker's already connected up. He says bills are cheaper and predictable. Ah, I've been expecting you, Mr Bond. Come on in, Mike. Show me what's going on in your cupboard. <laughs> Certainly. So this is the new heat exchange unit. Uh, it replaces uh, an oil boiler used to be in here, which was three times the size. Now the word's out. A village that's immune to gas and oil price spikes, meeting climate imperatives, easy conversion and so much heat, home insulation is no big deal. We've had a huge amount of interest from communities up and down the country, uh, particularly in Wales and rural areas, but probably over 100 different communities have reached out and we're actively helping over 100 different communities. Existing technology, not the dreams of carbon capture or boutique nuclear reactors. At local level here, at least, acting on the IPCC warning today to act now. Alex Thompson reporting there. Well, our climate reporter, Simon Roach, is with me now. Simon, there seems to be no shortage of reports like this. Why should we pay attention to this one? 
Well, it's actually really just about timing, Jackie, because uh, yes, in some ways, this is a routine publication. We get this about every six to seven years. But we already know from science that what happens this decade, really just uh, what we do now and what we do in the next few years, is absolutely crucial if we want to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Uh, so that's why this one is so key. Um, it's the last report we'll get from UN climate science body before the end of this crucial decade. And that's why, really, it's been described as a kind of final warning. But will it make any difference? Well, uh, today hasn't shifted that the pure science of climate change is already fairly settled. Uh, humans have caused global heating, and burning fossil fuels are largely responsible. Actually, today's report says that rich countries like ours are much more responsible for that than poorer ones. Um, where it gets messy is what to do about all of this. Because yes, the report says that fossil fuels are the problem, um, but it does not go on to, to explicitly say that we need to abandon them and that renewable energy is uh, the solution. Now, in this sense, it's not just science, it is also political. Um, you need to understand that these reports are signed off by governments. Um, now, I've been in touch with people that have been inside these closed door meetings over the past week where governments are signing off on this report. And they said that, yes, there were standoffs over uh, what the report says about reducing emissions. For example, the Saudi Arabian delegation resisted really heavily explicit language on renewable energy and said that fossil fuel language must be uh, watered down. The bottom line is this. What this report says is now gold standard science. But if you're a country that still wants to keep producing oil or natural gas, then you're not necessarily perturbed by it. Um, there's a kind of scientifically ordained route, if you like, to keep doing what you're doing. So if this really is the last decade to save the planet, and if we don't manage to get on track, then there is a real chance that historians will look back at moments like this as when we actually didn't manage to get on top of this crisis that's before us. Simon, thanks very much for talking to us. Chris. Thanks, Jackie. Well, I've been speaking to climate scientist Dr Tamsin Edwards, one of the lead authors of a previous IPCC assessment report in 2021. And I started by asking her about these IPCC warnings and if they are any different to what we've seen before. I understand why it feels a bit deja vu sometimes, doesn't it? Here we are, climate scientists basically saying the same thing again. You know, climate change is happening. You know, it's us that's causing it. It's going to continue. And the more climate change there is, the more glo global warming there is, the greater the impacts are going to be, whether that's on people or, or ecosystems around the world. So it, it is a kind of, yes, here we are again. But I think what's different here is, first of all, we are synthesising everything we've done in, in six reports over the last five years. Um, and we know everything in greater detail than ever before. We have more data. We have better computer models. We have better understanding of both the science, but also the different options out there. For that to convert into hard policy, is it blunt enough? Is it prescriptive enough? Does it say, stop drilling for oil, stop digging for coal? Well, that's really you know? down for the... To uh, well, that's really down to the policymakers to... to um, to say, isn't it? You know, if they read that, and and that's uh, that's down to them the decision. So it is up to politicians to look at your report and then say, well, that's what it means, rather than you telling them. The point about the IPCC is that it assesses the evidence, uh, the the science papers, the tech that we know about, all the expert kind of judgments and assessments, the data. Um, it doesn't say we should do this in terms of policies. It says if we want to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement of limiting warming to well below two degrees, pursuing efforts to one and a half, then these are the cuts we need to make. So, for example, cutting global emissions by nearly half this decade, 60% by 2035, net zero in the early 2050s, and something we don't talk about that much, which is getting to net negative emissions after that. So taking more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than we put in. There's not due to be another of these reports before 2030, um, by which time, if politicians and policymakers haven't responded to today's report, it will be too late. Um, so, I mean, why not? Is there not an argument for a, an annual report still? I think the fact that the IPCC has these long time cycles means that we can assess a big body of evidence and really get a robust clear understanding that we're really confident about. But we do have these shorter term reports. The one and a half degree report back in 2018 was a slightly shorter report. Um, I think we heard in the press conference today that they're talking about perhaps one of those on cities, climate change and cities. So there are these kind of shorter time scales. It's not like climate science stops and we hear nothing until the year 2030. Mm. Uh, but it's really about, you know, trying to get the, the evidence out there constantly and, and see it as part
part of the backdrop of our lives to make the decisions that we make rather than something we only think about every seven years. And, and do, do you feel that you have now, you know, beyond any doubt, shown the science um, and that this is man-made and that this is down to us um, and therefore it's over to politicians and people now? Or, or is there still more proof to come? The question now is delivery. How do we do it? What are the policies? Um, what, are the, what are the most effective mechanisms, whether that's um, governments, public, private, individuals, you know, across the board, across society? What are the ways we're actually going to get there? Because I do think that that ambition, that that acceptance is basically there now. The, the warning, if you like, that you're working on or have been working on, what would, what would sea level rises as you project them, mean for Britain? What are we looking at? Well, we're going to get um, more flooding around the coast, and um, that's going to vary a little bit around the coast. It's going to be worse, actually, in the southern parts of the UK uh, because of the, the way that the geography works. Basically, the land is rising up a bit in the sort of Scotland area and sinking a bit more in the, in the lower parts of the, the UK, the southern parts. So, but, but basically, we're going to get more sea level rise, so therefore more flooding. Um, so we're going to have to adapt to that. That's one of the things we're going to have to adapt to, whether it's uh, building defences like walls, whether it's thinking about nature-based systems like salt marshes and sort of nature kind of ecosystems to actually uh, be a soft defence to... And that's in. happening anyway? Well, that's the thing, you know, climate change is already happening, right? We've reached 1.1 degrees of warming already. We've seen the impacts of that um, around the world and we've seen it in the UK as well. Dr Edwards, thank you very much indeed.